very own Chuck Todd at Meet the Press, reminding the world there's plenty of blame to go around for the debacle unfolding in Afghanistan. Joining me now, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Democrat of California, Kevin Barron, executive editor at Defense One, and Tara Setmeyer, former Republican Congressional Communications Director and senior advisor for the Lincoln Project. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, Congresswoman Lee, you are the first sitting member of Congress to be a part of the sound off. And I'm giving you this opportunity um, to say, I told y'all so. Let's have a listen to you back on September 14th, 2001. However difficult this vote may be, some of us must urge the use of restraint. Our country is in a state of mourning. Some of us must say, let's step back for a moment. Let's just pause just for a minute and think through the implications of our actions today so that this does not spiral out of control. And, and here we are, uh, Congresswoman Lee, nearly 20 years after you made those remarks. Um, just what you're thinking and, and feeling as we watch the harrowing images coming out of Kabul these days. Sure, uh, Jonathan, nice to be with you. And what uh, I'm thinking and feeling is uh, our priorities in terms of what we must do to save lives. And as chair of the subcommittee, the Appropriations Subcommittee on Foreign Operations, part of what I'm working on and making sure of is that we get uh, our Americans out of Afghanistan and our Afghan allies, protect women and children, and trying to make sure that we uh, increase the cap on refugees, trying to be sure that we have the resources necessary to make sure that everyone is evacuated and also to make sure that uh, the refugee resettlement um, is such that our, our allies are going to work with us to make sure that people have a, a safe place to go. So I, right now, I'm concerned about the safe passage of everyone out of Afghanistan so that they do not uh, have to contend with risking their lives. Kevin, um Secretary Austin was on ABC earlier. Let's have a listen to what he had to say, and I'll ask you about it on the other side. I do, based upon, uh, you know, the, the, uh, what we were looking at and the inputs to the plan. But I think you have to go back and look at what, uh, what the administration inherited. I mean, we came in, and we were faced with a May 1 deadline uh, to, uh, to have all forces out of the country. This, this deal had been struck with the Taliban. And so he had to very rapidly go through uh, a detailed assessment and look at all options in terms of what, uh, you know, what, what he could do. And, and none of those options were good options. All right. So, Kevin, the secretary is saying that, you know, that President Biden had no good options. One of the major criticisms coming from Republicans is that, well, President Biden didn't have to abide by this, abide by this agreement with the Taliban. Is that even realistic? Well, I don't think it's whether or not Biden had to agree to leave at the deadline because of the agreement. It's what the agreement set up for that deadline. So remember, Trump pulled out thousands of troops and left behind that small force. Uh, and the agreement was, it was never a promise. It was always, you know, conditions based. If the Taliban meets points one, two, three, four, yada, yada down the road, then the United States will pull out completely. But the expectation of the complete pullout was harmful. Uh, putting the Taliban at the negotiating table uh, at, at Doha, some have argued, has been disastrous, even though others say you have to negotiate with the enemy to end a war. Um, but what it set up for Biden was, by the time May came around, the forces that were in Afghanistan, the U.S. forces, NATO forces, were just not enough to hold the rest of the country. Something was going to have to change. So there's been a lot of reporting saying how there was, a, there was an idea that maybe you could have enough forces in country or Biden could send in just a couple thousand more to hold Kabul. That way, the, inside of Kabul, you have Bagram Air Base, you have a footprint where the United States could continue to have leverage in the country to force the negotiation to continue longer, to keep Ghani's government intact, and to continue counterterrorism missions. Unfortunately, look how fast Ghani left. I think by that time, you know, there's an argument to be made that there was nothing left to protect, as Biden is saying, that, you know, Ghani leaving so fast has exposed the fragility of that government. Uh, giving up Bagram, giving up all the bases, and how, how easily the Taliban was able to walk into Kabul, exposed how Ghani, not just Ghani, but Hamid Karzai, the former president, Abdullah, the, the co-power sharer in, in government, had already been dealing with the Taliban to have this outcome. So 
in a sense, you know, Biden wasn't hamstrung by that May 1 agreement. He could easily have just said, as, as, as easily as he said to pull everyone out, he could have put 10,000 troops in and kept things going. But as, but as we know, the president's made it pretty clear in all the remarks he has made uh, since um, the, the tragedy is unfolding in Kabul that it, he's not, he's not going to do that. Tara, um, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy had an interesting way of weaving what's happening to Kabul to voting rights. Have a listen. We're fighting every step of the, every single day. We watched the Democrats because they could not pass H.R. 1. They're bringing up H.R. 4 now while thousands of Americans are being held hostage in Afghanistan. That is their priority because they know they're going to lose this election. We will fight just as we're going to fight this week and we will win. And the next century will be the American century because we know how to govern. Tara, what is he talking about? It's outrageous. Jonathan, that is an absolute disgraceful try, uh, spin, attempt to spin what's going on right now, to actually juxtapose that with civil rights and voting rights. When the Republican Party has become an anti-democratic party, they have become a, an author, a pro-authoritarian party that seems to think that it's perfectly fine to be an apologist for an insurrection. Um, <laughs> It, 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 it really, I, I'm so stunned by hearing Kevin McCarthy say that because of the level of gall and absurdity of it all um, to try to change the fact that it was the Republican president, Donald Trump, who negotiated this god-awful deal that put the Biden administration in this difficult situation. It was Pompeo who called the Taliban gentlemen. It was Pompeo who laughed in the face of Representative Colin Allred when he asked him during that tenure, what was going to happen? What would happen if there was a precipitous withdrawal and, the, and Kabul fell? And it was Pompeo who laughed in his face and said, well, I'm directing it. You're talking to the person. And that's not, you know, that's not going to happen. We'll brief you. You know, it was Pompeo that refused to include turning over al-Qaeda, as Liz Cheney mentioned, to turn over al-Qaeda prisoners. It was, it was Pompeo and the Trump administration that sandbagged the State Department um, to help get some of these Afghan allies of ours out through that special immigrant visa program. There's an 18,000-person backlog because it was that administration that uh, gutted the State Department and had no interest in keeping America's promise to these people, these brave Afghans that helped us there. That was them. So, you know... The, the absolute uh, unmitigated gall of Kevin McCarthy to try to lump uh, voting rights, which Republicans are actively trying to suppress throughout this country, is really unspeakable and shameful. And we should keep, we should continue to call them out for trying to change the subject where they lay the predicate for what we're seeing right now. Does the Biden administration have some fault in the execution of this? Absolutely. But let's not forget who laid the foundation for where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And Congresswoman Lee, I would love to get your reaction to your fellow Californian and what he had to, and what he had to say in that clip we just showed. Sure, uh, Jonathan. Uh, first of all, uh, Kevin McCarthy laid it out very clearly. He is trying to take a right, the right to vote away from many, many people in our country, primarily African-Americans, people of color, senior citizens, the disabled, young people. And so I think that uh, what he has shown by this comment is that he supports the voter suppression laws that are taking place all across the country, and he give, he does not give a darn about our democracy and people's constitutional right to vote. And so we have to call him on it. Uh, we've got to pass H.R. 4, which we're going to pass this week. We've got to pass H.R. 1. Uh, this is a fundamental uh, constitutional right. And so Kevin McCarthy, to me, has really showed his hand in terms of how he cares about uh, our democracy. And mm -hmm. I believe that he is totally supportive of the Donald Trump uh, agenda uh, to lead this country into authoritarian rule. And that is what Kevin McCarthy is really standing for. And that is what he is doing. Uh, I'm going to go to my, get the last word to my favorite Kevin. Uh, Kevin Barron, real quick. Um, the deadline for getting everybody out is, uh, is August 31st. Do you think President Biden will let that deadline slide and keep doing the work to get folks out? I think they have to. They've already declared their own red lines. And it's not the uh, August 31st deadline. It's the fact that Biden and Austin and the administration have all said that they will get all Americans out and all Afghans who help Americans out. That's the new red line. It's going to take a lot longer. 
And with that, we're going to leave it there. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Kevin Barron, and Tara Setmeyer, thank you all very much.